Hello, and welcome to the Parker Hannifin Corporation Fiscal 2024 Fourth Quarter and Full Year Earnings Conference Call and Webcast. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star zero. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. You may be placed into question queue at any time by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. We ask you please limit yourselves to one question, one follow-up, then return to the queue. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It's now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Todd Liam Bruno, Chief Financial Officer. Please go ahead, Todd. Thank you, Kevin, and good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to Parker's fiscal year 2024 fourth quarter uh, and year-end earnings release webcast. Uh, as Kevin said, this is Todd Liam Bruno, Chief Financial Officer speaking. And with me today is our Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Jenny Parmentier. We appreciate your interest in Parker, and we thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if I could draw your attention to slide two, you will find our disclosure, disclosures on our forward-looking projection for non-GAAP financial measures. Uh, actual results could vary from our forecast based on the items we have listed here. Our press release, uh, the presentation we're going to go through today, and uh, reconciliations for all non-GAAP financial measures were released this morning and are available under the investor section uh, on our website at parker.com. We're going to start the call today with Jenny summarizing our record fiscal year 2024 uh, that was really driven by our portfolio transformation and really some exceptional strength in our aerospace businesses. Uh, she'll also touch on our bright future and what really is driving the company today. Uh, I'm going to follow Jenny with uh, some more details on specifically the strong fourth quarter we just posted. And then uh, both of us are going to provide some color on the uh, fiscal year 2025 guide that we released this morning that sets us off on our journey to achieve our FY29 targets. After those remarks, we'll open uh, the call for Q&A session. We'll try to take as many questions as possible within the uh, one hour time slot. And with that, Jenny, I'm gonna hand it over to you and ask everyone to uh, reference slide three. Thank you, Todd. And thank you to everyone for joining the call today. Parker delivered an outstanding year in fiscal 2024 on the dedication of our people, the strength and balance of our portfolio, and the value of our business system, the win strategy. We met or exceeded many of our commitments for FY24. We produced top quartile safety performance, aligned with our goal to be the safest industrial company in the world. The strength of our portfolio was highlighted by a stellar year delivered by our aerospace systems segment. On low single-digit sales growth, the team delivered 200 basis points of margin expansion. Our earnings per share grew 18% on top of earnings growth of 15% in fiscal year 2023. And we generated record-free cash flow of $3 billion. Parker has a very promising future ahead, as you'll see from our strong fiscal year 25 guide and the targets we have set for fiscal year 2029. Next slide, please. And it was a record year for aerospace, our first full year with Megat, achieving over $5 billion in sales, more than two times the sales of fiscal year 20. All market segments delivered double-digit sales growth, and the strength continues as we look ahead. We are positioned for growth with significant content on leading programs, and our extensive portfolio will continue to create value for our customers as well as our large installed base will drive continued aftermarket growth. Next slide, please. As illustrated on this slide, the transformation of our portfolio further expanded longer cycle and secular revenue mix in fiscal year 24. And although aerospace is a big part of the transformation, it's not the whole story. The acquisitions of Clark Corps and Lord and our on-purpose strategy to expand distribution in Europe and Asia have greatly contributed to the longer cycle, secular and industrial aftermarket mix. We see this transformation continuing and expect 85% of our portfolio to be longer cycle, secular and aftermarket by fiscal year 29. Early last week, we announced that we have signed an agreement to divest the North American composites business that came with the mega acquisition. As mentioned during our investor day, we continue to optimize our portfolio. Our best owner playbook identifies businesses that find greater value with a different owner. Through this process, we determined that this business is not aligned with our core products and we are not the best owner. 
It's a great team, and we are confident that they will be successful in the future. Next slide, please. These are the four key messages we presented at our Investor Day in May. We are positioned for growth with our interconnected technologies and the secular trends. We have demonstrated that Win Strategy, our business system, is compounding our performance and driving us to top quartile. Operational excellence, years of driving a continuous improvement culture through our lean tools, creates growth and expands margins. And we have confidence in achieving the fiscal year 29 targets launched at our investor day in May. Next slide, please. And as a reminder of what drives Parker, safety, engagement, and ownership are the foundation of our culture. It's our people and living up to our purpose that drives top quartile performance, allowing us to be great generators and deployers of cash. I'll turn it back to Todd to review our outstanding fourth quarter results. Thank you, Jenny. It really was a fantastic year for the company. Um, on slide nine, I just would like to take some time to talk about uh, the fourth quarter. Q4 was an exceptionally strong quarter for the company. Uh, once again, every number in this gold box on this page is a Q4 record. Um, they all also happen to be the highest levels of performance that we uh, experienced this fiscal year. Uh, total sales growth was up nearly 2% from prior year. Uh, we reached uh, almost $5.2 billion in sales in the quarter. Organic sales were positive at, at roughly 3%. Uh, that was a little bit better than what we were expecting with our guidance. Um, the divestitures were just very slight, uh, unfavorable impact, and currency really turned into another headwind, uh, almost 1% unfavorable on currency. If you look at adjusted segment operating margins, Jenny mentioned this, but uh, we did improve them 130 basis points from prior year, and uh, for the first time in the history of the company, we generated 25.3% uh, segment operating margins uh, for a quarter. Uh, same story with the uh, EBITDA margins. Uh, the increase was a little bit greater, 190 basis points. Uh, for the quarter, we did 26.3% adjusted EBITDA margins. You look at adjusted net income, uh, $884 million of adjusted net income. That is up 12% from prior year, and that is a 17.0 return on sales. Uh, earnings per share, Jenny mentioned this as well, 677. Uh, that was up uh, 69 cents or 11 cents from prior year. And it was just really an exceptionally strong quarter. It was a great way to finish the fiscal year, uh, really driven uh, universally across uh, the globe by our uh, engaged team members. And it was really just a nice way to finish the year. And it's another data point on Parker being able to deliver on our commitments. If we jump to slide 10, this is just the bridge on that 11% improvement and adjusted earnings per share. Uh, again, the story is very similar to what we saw all year, strong operating execution continues to drive uh, earnings per share growth. If you look at segment operating income dollars, we increased by $90 million, or 7%. Uh, that's basically 54 cents, or 80% of the EPS growth uh, quarter over quarter. Um, and we've talked a lot about this already, but the aerospace system segment, once again, is really uh, responsible for over 90% of the uh, earnings per share growth when it, when it comes to segment operating income. Uh, the diversified industrial North American businesses uh, made up the rest. If you look at uh, some of the below uh, segment operating income line, corporate G&A was $0.16 cents favorable in the quarter. That really, again, was a result of some uh, favorable items from the prior year, just not repeating. Uh, interest expense, favorable again, $0.17 cents versus prior year. Uh, that really is the result of our successful uh, deleveraging efforts that we've been working hard on all year. Tax was unfavorable, 12 cents uh, against the prior year, and that was really just from slightly higher uh, operating tax rate and, of course, the higher um, EBIT. Um, and then other expense and share count were just both a bit uh, higher than last year, but really the story here has been consistent throughout the whole year, strong operating execution, uh, driving margin expansion, really keeping an eye on cost controls and being uh, disciplined with our debt pay down. Just a nice way to finish the year. Uh, if we jump to slide 11, let's look at the segment performance. Uh, you can see, uh, again, margin expansion across every business here. Really proud to see that. Uh, incrementals for the company and really every uh, part of the business were incredibly strong. Order rates inflected positive. Uh, it's 1% that's uh, positive. We're really happy to see that. And our backlog uh, remained at uh, near record levels. We have $10.9 billion dollars in uh, shippable backlog, so that was a nice way to uh, finish the year. Uh, let's look at the diversified industrial segment, 
specifically in North America, sales volume really remained strong, $2.2 billion in sales. Organic growth was uh, negative three, uh, but that was a full point better than our expectations. Uh, softness in North America continues to be driven by uh, off-highway markets and transportation markets. Uh, but despite those uh, lower volumes, uh, we were able to increase adjusted segment operating margins by 150 basis points, and uh, the North American businesses achieved 25.0. That is a record. Um, it is all driven by operational execution, uh, executing the win strategy, and really working hard to uh, deliver for our customers. Uh, order rates in North America also did improve to uh, flat. Uh, that uh, ends our negative string of uh, year-over-year uh, order uh, declines, and we were really happy to see that. If you look at the international businesses, sales were slightly over $1.4 billion. Organic growth was down 2.5% to prior year, but again, that was also better than our forecast. Uh, Off-highway markets continue to be soft. And if you look really across the regions uh, in uh, Europe, we were negative 5, and Asia-Pac negative 1, which did slightly improve from, uh, from Q3, and Latin America just continues to be robust at 19% uh, organic growth. Um, same story on the margins. Margins increased 60 basis points uh, in the quarter. Uh, our international businesses generated 23.9% segment operating margins and really just continue to be focused on simplification, productivity improvements, and um, I'm really happy to see this in the continued margin expansion from those international businesses. Order rates in international uh, finished at minus one. Uh, with positive order rates in Asia driving uh, the majority of the improvement. So uh, nice to see that uh, improve from Q3 as well. Um, but if we look at aerospace systems, right, that business continues to shine. Sales reached a record $1.5 billion in aerospace. First time we've had $1.5 billion of uh, sales in our aerospace business. Organic growth, 19%, with double-digit uh, growth across all the platforms within aerospace. Operating margins, a brand-new record increasing 130 basis points to 27.1, and uh, it really is driven by great volumes and um, unbelievable strength in the uh, aftermarket businesses. Um, aerospace orders still remain strong. Uh, we did get the highest dollar level of orders for the year, and order rates continue to grow at uh, plus 7%. So all things are looking up in aerospace. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, tw slide 12, I just want to highlight our cash flow Performance for the year, we finished FY24 with record cash flow performance. Uh, CFOA increased 14% to a record of $3.4 billion. That's 17% of sales. Uh, free cash flow, uh, nearly $3 billion. That's also a record. That was 15% of sales. It's also a 15% increase from prior year, and we did achieve a conversion of 105%. Um, I really just want to thank our team. This has been a lot of effort by a lot of people across the company, uh, really made some nice improvements in working capital, uh, really nice um, efforts on AP and AR, but I really want to note this year we were able to reduce inventory by over $120 million, um, really showcasing the efforts and focus that we've had on supply chain excellence. Uh, across the globe, we continue to focus on being great generators and great deployers of cash. Uh, if we jump to slide 13, you can see what we did with all that cash. We reduced debt by over $800 million in the quarter, $800 million in the quarter alone. And since closing MEGIT, we have now reduced debt by over $3.4 billion. Uh, we had a target to reduce debt by $2 billion in the fiscal year. We hit that target. And if you look at our leverage ratios, gross debt to adjusted EBITDA is now 2.1 times, and net debt to adjusted EBITDA is now 2.0. So it's exactly what we had forecast. And uh, it really wraps up just a solid Q4 and a great uh, fiscal year. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it back to Jenny, and I'm going to uh, get to what I know everyone is focused on, and that is our outlook for FY25. Thank you, Todd. So at our Investor Day in May, we introduced the six key market verticals of our business that you see on this slide. This slide represents our FY25 sales growth forecast for each market vertical resulting in organic growth of 2 to 5%. We are providing a realistic guide for fiscal year 25. At the midpoint of this guide, we have aerospace at 8.5%, industrial North America at 2%, and industrial international at 1.5%. 
We are confident in growing EPS, achieving mega synergies, and continuing our track record of expanding margins. I'll give it back to Todd to review the guide in a little more detail. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Um, so I'm now on slide uh, 16, and let me share some of the details uh, of the FY25 uh, guide. Um, reported sales is forecast to be in the range of one and a half to four and a half, or three percent at the midpoint. That will equate to approximately 20.5 20 $20 billion dollars in sales. Uh, that is really supported by outside uh, outside support in our aerospace businesses. Uh, total sales for the company are modeled at 48 percent in the first half and 52 percent in the second half, so right in line with what we've historically uh, done on uh, sales splits. If you look specifically at organic growth, we are forecasting organic growth in the range of 2 to 5 percent, or 3 and a half percent at the midpoint. Uh, and we're expecting high single-digit growth from uh, aerospace, uh, roughly 8.5 percent, and, and a gradual recovery in the industrial markets throughout FY25. For the North American businesses, we are forecasting organic growth of 2 percent at the midpoint. And for the international businesses, we are forecasting growth of 1.5 percent organic at the midpoint for the full year. Uh, if you look at the mix on organic growth, uh, it's 2.5 percent first half, 4.5 percent growth second half. And um, I will note that this uh, guidance does include sales from the uh, recently announced or, uh, divestiture that Jenny mentioned. We are expecting that to close sometime in the second quarter, and we will give an update once that closes uh, to the impact it has on the, uh, on the company. Uh, we are based on uh, June 30th currency spot rates, and we're forecasting that to be a slight headwind of about a half a percent, or $100 million on currency uh, versus prior year. Uh, Jenny mentioned margin expansion. 50 basis points of margin expansion is our plan. And in uh, FY25, we're going to get that by continuing to do exactly what we've done over the last couple of years, is really uh, implement and uh, advance the win strategy. Adjusted segment operating margin guidance is 25.4 at the midpoint. There is a range of 20 basis points on either side of that. And segment operating income is split 47% first half, 53% second half. If you do the math on in incrementals, we're expecting slightly uh, at 40% incremental, incremental margins. That's a little bit higher than what we normally have had, just based on the growth in aerospace and, of course, uh, continued mega uh, synergies. A um, few additional items on the guide. Corporate G&A is expected to be approximately $230 million. Interest expense is $450 million. That is a reduction of uh, approximately $50 million from FY24. And other expense is expected to be about $5 million. Tax rate, uh, we are modeling a 23% tax rate. And full year, as reported, EPS of $23 or adjusted EPS of $26. Uh, 65. Both of those figures are at the midpoint, and the range on those, uh, both of those ranges is 35 cents uh, on the high end and the uh, low end. And if you look at adjusted EPS, it is split 47% first half, 53% second half. Uh, in respect to cash flow for the full year, we are giving a range of $3 billion to $3.3 billion. That is $3.15 billion at the midpoint. That will be uh, approximately 15.3 percent of sales, and of course, we expect free cash flow conversion to be greater than 100%. Um, if you look at the far right column on this page, you'll see some specifics, uh, specifically about Q1, and these are all at the midpoint. Reported sales, we are forecasting to be uh, plus one. Uh, organic growth is one and a half uh, percent positive. Adjusted segment margins of 25.2 and adjusted EPS is expect, expected to be $6.05. Uh, as usual, we've provided several other details uh, for guidance in the appendix. If you look at slide uh, 17, this is a very similar story to what we just did in FY24. Uh, segment operating income is the main driver of our EPS growth. That is $1.51 of EPS growth. We'll continue to have lower interest expense as a, re a result of our great cash flow generation and our deleveraging efforts. That will add $0.34 cents to EPS. Um, if you look at the tax rate, that will be an unfavorable number. Just a reminder that that will be a 23% uh, model tax rate. That is a headwind of $0.41, cents, uh, really compared to um, a favorable rate that we had in the full year of FY24. Uh, corporate G&A is slightly unfavorable, just $0.06. Cents. 
Other expense is uh, 10 cents unfavorable, and share count is just uh, another headwind of 7 cents. But if you look at that all in, that's our walk to the 26.65 midpoint or 5% increase um, year over year. Uh, with that, Jenny, I'm going to hand it back to you and uh, ask everyone to reference slide 18. Thanks, Todd. As mentioned at our investor day and demonstrated in our results, this is a different Parker. We will add more than $10 to EPS and generate an additional 50% free cash flow by fiscal year 29. Our performance will continue to be accelerated from the wind strategy. We have a longer cycle and more resilient portfolio. We will experience growth from secular trends, and we will continue to be great generators and deployers of cash. Next slide, please. We are very proud to be celebrating 60 years on the New York Stock Exchange and will ring the closing bell next week on Wednesday, August 14th. I'll turn it back to Todd to get us started with Q&A. Yeah, okay, Kevin, we are ready to uh, open the lines for Q&A and we'll take uh, the first uh, person in the queue. Certainly. If you'd like to be placed into the question queue, please press star 1 at this time. And as a reminder, we ask you please limit yourselves to one question, one follow-up, then return to the queue. If you'd like to remove yourself from the queue, please press star 2. Our first question is coming from Julian Mitchell from Barclays. Your line is now live. Hi, good morning. Um, maybe um, just a, a first question around the uh, first quarter um, outlook. Um, so I think first off, um, maybe to talk about the organic sales guide a little bit, um, you know, I think you're dialing in a, a bit of a deceleration from the, the June quarter year on year, even with better orders. Um, so maybe just any commentary around kind of very recent demand trends, any big movement month to month. And then sort of on the, the firm-wide P&L for Q1, you're basically saying flat, EPS dollars year on year, but with um, sales growth and margins up. So is there something below the line moving around? Yeah, Julian, this is uh, this is Todd. I, I could take that. You know, there is some seasonality just going from Q4 to Q1. If you look at uh, you know our historical sales splits and our historical our earnings split, what we're modeling here is in line with what we've uh, historically done. Um, our organic growth guide for the total company is uh, plus one for the uh, for the quarter. Um, that is driven by aerospace, uh, which, which continues to be uh, low double-digit organic growth is what we're expecting in aerospace. But um, in the industrial businesses, both in North America and international, we are still expecting that to be uh, down from prior year. So it's uh, low single digits, but it's still down. We expect that to improve throughout the fiscal year, and uh, this is just our best look at, at a roll-up. So. So you're right. It is. Um, it's a little bit of a soft uh, industrial environment, but really uh, offset by uh, strength in aerospace. Um, if you look at uh, margins, you know what we just did in Q4 uh, was uh, all-time record for the quarter. Uh, we are uh, guiding to 25.2 percent. That would be a Q1 record for the company. So it is not an easy uh, number there. It really is. Uh, it would be a record. And uh, to do that in light of some softness on the industrial side of the business, we're, we're pretty proud about that. You know, there's some below-the-line stuff that just, you know, is a, is a first-quarter phenomenon, but nothing uh, abnormal. Um, we are uh, experiencing uh, earnings per share growth and net income growth in Q4, and that really uh, supports what we, what we see throughout the uh, balance of the, of the year. <clears throat> That's helpful. Thank you. And then maybe just my follow-up would be around um, slide 15. So you have that very helpful um, color on the end market verticals outlook for the year. Um, maybe just any context you could give um, around sort of, you know, maybe fourth quarter um, rates in, in some of those end markets. And I suppose in plant and industrial, I'm particularly focused on um, seems like the CapEx environment is getting a little bit worse out there. Uh, just wondered what you're seeing in that implant and industrial piece, please. Sure, Julian, be happy to do that. So if you look at implant and industrial equipment, um, it improved from negative low single digit um, in Q3 to neutral in Q4. And as you can see on the slide that you're referencing, our FY25 guide is forecasting neutral in the first half low single digit in the second half, resulting in a low single digit for the full year. 
If you look at transportation, it uh, was mid-single-digit negative in Q4, and that was primarily driven by um, automotive cars and light trucks. We are forecasting low single-digit negative growth for transportation in the first half, mid-single-digit growth in the second half, because we uh, expect automotive to return to growth then. Um, work truck strength continues, and heavy-duty truck is, is positive now, so full year is at that low single-digit growth. If you look at off-highway, it was high single-digit negative in Q4, and we are forecasting the same for the first half, neutral for the second half, and mid-single-digit negative for the full year. Um, inside of there, we expect ag to be double-digit negative this year, um, offset by construction, low single-digit positive. Um, so that's, uh, that's some color there. And then energy is forecasted to be low single-digit for fiscal year 25, neutral in the first half, mid-single-digit in the second half. Uh, HVAC was uh, low single-digit negative for Q4, but it is improving. We are forecasting mid-single-digit growth for the first half. This is driven by a recent regulation change on refrigerant. And the second half growth forecast is at low single-digit growth. But that's dependent on um, how fast some of these manufacturers get through their inventory and, and ramp up production under the new regulation. So for the full year, we have them at low single-digit. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Thank you. Next question is coming from David Razzo from Evercore ISI. Your line is now live. Hi, thank you. My questions are on your comfort with the organic sales guide. Right? We have 1.5% in the first quarter. We can back into 2Q, right? It's 3.5%. So that 2% faster growth in 2Q from 1Q, uh, I'm, the impression I get, that's coming from industrial going from, you know, say, down 1.5%, 2% in the first quarter to, to going slightly positive. And I just wanted to get some color on, on why do we see that turning flat to positive in 2Q. The comps get a little easier in North America, but just any color around that, particularly you know, in the mix of orders. Are you seeing it more from distributors? Is it the lack of destock maybe from a year ago at the manufacturers? Just trying to get more comfortable with that delta on year-over-year -year growth for industrial 1Q and then getting you know, essentially you know, slightly positive for 2Q. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that, David. So, um, you know, as some of the things that Todd mentioned earlier, you know, total company order rates did go positive to 1% in Q4. Industrial North America improved to zero in Q4 um, after being negative four. So that, that was a positive sign, and as Todd mentioned, that did end five quarters of negative order entry. Uh, international orders improved to negative one from negative eight, and that was driven by uh, Asia Pacific. Um, when you look at, you know, at the channel, that destocking in the channel started over a year ago, and, and we believe that it has pretty much played out. Uh, we see the distribution trend going up, but I would say it's not a step change yet. Um, we aren't actually seeing them add inventory, um, but, you know, these are all the things that, that are into, you know, are placed into our guide. Todd mentioned also uh, the backlog remains strong, um, you know, Q4 flat with Q3, dollars at near record levels. So all of these things are, are based are baked into the guide and, and the reason that um, we feel good with the organic growth numbers we have in the first half. Right, hey, hey, David, David, I, just, David I, I, I agree with everything Jenny said there. Um, as usual, your math is spot on. Um, you mentioned the comps. Comps are 2% are easier in uh, Q2 than uh, against the prior. So it's a little bit of all that stuff, but uh, I just wanted to call out the comps. Uh, yeah, the reason I, the reason I asked is it doesn't seem like there's much pricing, you know, new pricing for July one, so I'm just trying to figure out what's the incremental bump maybe. But you're saying there's a little bit of comp and and you know obviously yeah, I mean, we're, friends, we've, we may have some tech up. Right? We're a back to a we're back to a normal pricing environment, so you know um, it's it's more about you know those comps um, getting easier. You know, if you look at North America, you know Todd mentioned this. You know, we expect Q1 to be flat to Q4. Um, but that gradual industrial recovery is, is what we have um, really baked into the guide. And the growth uptick, mainly in the second half, is, you know, on easier accounts. And, and follow-up, if you could indulge me with one question, you don't have to answer it. But I'm curious, the verticals that we're now breaking out, we know the margins in aerospace, obviously, they're, they're highlighted separately. But the other five verticals, would you 
give us a sense of kind of force rank, highest to lowest, the margins between those five, just so we get a sense of the mix looking at it in this format? No, we're not going to disclose that, David. All right, I tried. All right, thank you. <laughs> you did. Uh, you know, I would I would tell you just look at those uh, the diversified industrial segment. Those margins are, uh, you know, they're they're record levels. Uh, they the international businesses are not that far off from the North American businesses, and it's really just a factor of uh, some softness in Europe and and Asia kind of going through um, um, a, a recovery mode. Um, but the margins are strong across all of those uh, verticals, David. All, All the businesses are performing really well in margin expansion. Thank you. Next question is coming from Scott Davis from Millie's Research. Your line is now live. Hey, good morning, uh, Jenny and Todd, and congrats on um, another uh, another great year. Good morning, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know it's it's probably hasn't the answer probably hasn't changed much since the analyst day, but. Uh, perhaps you could give us a little bit of an update on uh, an M&A and what you're seeing. I think, uh, you know, you clearly have balance sheet space to, to probably step up and get a little bit more aggressive. So um, just a little bit of an update would be helpful, I think. Thanks. Yeah, you're right. Um, not not a lot different, but, you know, obviously, um, you know, we still have some debt to pay down. That's still our focus. Um, but when we look to acquisitions, you know, we're always working the pipeline. Um, those relationships and maintaining and building those relationships is really important to us, and, and we've been doing quite a bit of that. Um, you know, we're, we're looking for those things where we are the clear best owner with the interconnected technologies and uh, building on the secular trends. But, you know, the one thing that I say the most is that, you know, we're looking for deals that are accretive to growth. Um, resiliency, margins, cash flow, and EPS, it really has to, to tick all of those boxes and, you um, in some cases, it, it really is, is based on timing. So we like all of the eight core technologies, and um, we see opportunities to build on the entire portfolio. We have um, different businesses that we're looking at of, of all sizes. So a question that I get a lot, too, is, you know, you've built with each one. Is the next one going to be, um, you know, bigger than Megat? And that's, you know, that's not, um, that's not something that, you know, we're focused on. We're focused on the right deal with all of that criteria that I just mentioned. Okay. And, Jenny, the, the portfolio optimization and the, the small divestiture, is, is the lens here that you guys are looking at, the, you know, the slide 15 lens, the, you know, the key market vertical stuff that's outside of that verticals, or is, there a, or is it more a function of kind of margin, growth potential, and kind of more traditional metrics? It's the latter. We we have to see that it's you know po part of our core technologies, our core product offering. Um, you know, obviously this business was in aerospace, and that's a market that we're very fond of. But it's um, the future profile of the business, both margin expansion and growth. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Mick Dobre from Baird. Your line is now live. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I, I guess one of the things that kind of stood out to me over the past uh, couple of quarters within your uh, industrial technology platforms is that um, motion systems and flow and process control kind of behave the way we would sort of expect them to in the kind of industrial downturn we're, exper we're experiencing, you know, this whole down high single digit revenue type. Um, but your filtration engineered materials platform has been um, pretty remarkably stable. So I guess my question is, uh, looking back, why has that been the case? Is this sort of different than what you've seen in, in, in prior downturns? And is there a impact on margin from a mixed standpoint within your industrial business from this filtration business hanging in there a little bit better? Yeah, so thanks for the question, Mick. So, you know, if you if you think back to the on-purpose strategy that we had with our acquisitions to double the size of filtration, double, si double the size of engineer materials and aerospace, we've done that with the last four acquisitions. So if you take filtration, um, for instance, you know, with the acquisition of Clarkor, um, we greatly increased our aftermarket exposure in filtration, and that business has become... Um, more resilient than it was in the past. 
And when you look at um, Lord into engineered materials, you know, that's where we picked up a lot of that longer cycle business. And so you see those two groups behaving a little bit differently than the other two that you mentioned. That is that is definitely the main reason. And, and, and the margin impact? The margin impact is accretive, just like you know the um, you know the criteria that we give to the to the acquisitions that we would do in the future. Um, these have been those have both been very successful deals where synergies um, were hit, and they continue to use the win strategy to improve margin. Maybe let, me, let me give you a little color on this. If, if you're worried, um, we agree with you. The top line has acted exactly ha as we expected it. But I would tell you the margin expansion has been equally generated by all of these businesses. Um, when you look at that record that we put up for uh, for the quarter, 25.4, uh, uh, that motion systems platform, that flow and process control, those were uh, equally uh, contributing to those uh, margin records. Yeah. Wouldn't, so have, it's, wouldn't uh, have happened without those yeah. uh, two areas. Yeah. And uh, when you look at the cash that we generate, those businesses are uh, stellar cash flow generators as well. So um, it's all part of the mix. It's all why we love the portfolio as it sits, and uh, it's helped generating uh, all-time record numbers. And those technologies are a very important part of our portfolio and, um, you know, participate in the secular trends that we talk about. Thanks for the caller. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Jamie Cook from Truist Security. Your line is now live. Hi, good morning, and congratulations on a nice quarter and guide. Um, I guess uh, my first question, Todd or Jenny, I'm just looking at the implied incrementals for the year, the 40%. It's a, it's a very good incremental margin above your targeted range on lower organic growth relative to your longer-term guide. So is there anything unusual in your – yeah, in you know, in in the mix this year, that would allow you to have above average incrementals on a low organic growth versus your targeted range. Um, and then I guess the the follow up question um, is, you know, once you get to the four to six percent organic growth, like why shouldn't your incremental margins be better than that? Um, just given what we're seeing already today. And then Jenny, you're probably not going to want to ans answer this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, you know, the order surprised me both on industrial North America and on international. Anything you can do to talk to, like, the cadence of what you saw, um, you know, since April and, and where were there – did the orders um, outperform your, your expectations as well? Thank you. Yeah, Jenny, let me, let me start on the incrementals. Uh, this, this is Todd. Thank you for the, uh, the recognition of the quarter. We appreciate that. Um, you're right. The, the incrementals are a little bit higher than what we have uh, historically uh, – Forecast and you know that that 30% is really kind of over the cycle. So sometimes we think we could do better. Sometimes uh, it might be a challenge on the top line. Um, but the way the math works is a little bit funny, right? Um, aerospace with the strong growth in aerospace and the margin profile that aerospace is operating at, it is driving the incrementals for the company um, a little bit higher than than normal. Um, we also are committed to the 300 million in synergies that we. Uh, have promised for Megat. We expect $50 million of uh, incremental synergies in FY25 versus FY24. So that's putting aerospace a little bit higher than uh, historically where we've been at. And when you look at the industrial businesses, um, you know, we still see margin expansion even in uh, a low growth uh, uh, top line environment. So when you put all that together, that's how we came up with, uh, with the numbers. So we feel we feel really good about that, that the team is uh, energized and uh, focused on making sure that we deliver that. And, you know, from an order standpoint, Jamie, you know, I um, on the May call, I did something that, you know, I normally don't do, but made the comment that, you know, we were encouraged at the start of the quarter with what we were seeing in orders. And um, obviously that continued and we saw ourselves get to the order condition that we're talking about today at the end of Q4. So, um, you know, that, that played out well for us. Um, but, you know, what we have in the guide today, um, you know, is supported by, you know, the comments that we've made at those, those Q4 orders. So no, no additional color on, on orders. Okay. Thank you. Nice job. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Joe Ritchie from Goldman Sachs. Your line is now live. Hi. Uh, good morning, Jenny and Todd. Uh, terrific year. Uh, not just the quarter. It was a great year. Um, Thank you. I'm going to... I'm going to, I'm going to tackle uh, the margin question maybe slightly differently. 
Uh, and so, look, the exit rate for the industrial businesses uh, were really strong, right, both in North America and international. If you take a look at the, the 25% in North America and, you know, the 239 in international, you know, squarely either at the high end of your guidance for this year uh, or the bend point for the international segment, I guess, why, why isn't it going to be better than that uh, if we're going to expect some growth and typically – you guys have have shown that you could uh, you could expand margins even in a no growth environment. Well, Joe, I'll, I'll start. I, I'm looking at Jenny. She's smiling. Um, you know, we just a few uh, months ago gave you the FY29 uh, targets, and if you look at this, this is right on track with those uh, FY29 targets. Um, aerospace, we're going to expand 100. Uh, basis points off of uh, an all-time record for that business. And, um, you know, when you look at the industrial businesses, we're showing margin expansion there as well, um, and really an unbelievably uh, low growth uh, top-line number. So we feel really uh, good about that. If you look at the cadence throughout the year, um, every one of these quarters would be a record uh, margin number for us, and it increases um, you know, outside of Q2, which is a little bit of seasonal volume, um, you know, they're, uh, they're aggressive numbers. So uh, that's what we feel today. That's what, that's what we uh, have confidence in. And that was kind of all that went into our guide. Yeah, I, I would just back that up by saying, you know, obviously it was a fantastic year. It was a fantastic exit rate. Um, but, you know, this, this guide is, is realistic. And this isn't, this isn't a slam dunk for our teams. We we believe in the win strategy. We believe in our ability to continue to expand margins. But um, you know, this this is a um, this this isn't you know easy. Okay, got it. Uh, I, you'll, I'm sure you'll make it look easy. But the uh, the follow-up <laughs> question try. is the uh, we'll try. <laughs> yeah, the. Uh, so, so you mentioned uh, that you're still planning to, to continue to pay down debt. Um, you got your leverage ratio, your net leverage down to two turns, so congrats on that. Uh, I know there was a question earlier uh, around M&A. So just, just, just talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, what's the kind of right leverage ratio that you want to get to before you, before you get a little bit more uh, front-footed um, with, with capital deployment on the M&A side? And then, you know, is there is is there an opportunity to continue to buy back shares as well? Like, how are you thinking about that priority going forward? Yeah, Joe, it's a great question. It's something we talk about uh, constantly here. Um, we've been very clear. You know, our target was to get uh, to and operate around a 2.0 uh, net debt to uh, adjusted EBITDA leverage. We got there. We're very proud about that. It was not easy, um, but uh, the team worked really hard to get there. Um, the way our debt is structured, we have a serviceable debt that goes all the way out into uh, 2026. So we feel uh, good that we will not uh, uh, we'll be putting our cash to good work as we continue to pay down that debt. But I would tell you, um, our, our preference continues to be to deploy our uh, capital optionality towards uh, deals. And Jenny mentioned it earlier. It's going to be the right deal. It's not going to be one that just happens to be available. It's got to be able to grow uh, the top line differently. It's got to be accretive to our margins. It's going to have to uh, be EPS accretive, and it's going to have to help generate cash in a way that's different than what uh, the company has been able to generate. Um, and if we can't get those done, we have no uh, worries about uh, deploying that elsewhere. Uh, we're going to keep our dividend record going, and uh, our share buyback is uh, – 200 million a year. We're going to do that uh, at a bare minimum, and uh, we will be active. I can could, I could assure you that. And you know, if the timing and the deal don't line up the way you know we'd like one to in the future, you know, we'll always buy back shares. Like Todd said, I mean, we we believe in Parker. Great. Thank you both. Thank you. Next question is coming from Stephen Volkman from Jeffries. Your line is now live. Great. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, Todd, I just missed it when you said the Maggot Synergies in FY24. Oh, yeah. We um, we increased those Maggot Synergies, I think that was in the second quarter or the third quarter. Uh, 200 million is what um, the accumulated synergies were at, at the end of FY24. 
Uh, we're committed to the $300 million number. Uh, that would be $50 million in FY25 and an additional $50 million in FY26. Got it. Thank you. And then I'm trying to think just mentally, if I back that out, how how much did mix add uh, relative to sort of other drivers for the margin in aerospace? Yeah, I mean, everything in aerospace is really booming right now. Um, aftermarket is, is especially strong. You know the profile of that business. Uh, that uh, That is the highest margin business that we have, and it's been uh, really robust. So, you know, if you look at what they uh, did for the quarter, I think it was uh, – uh, 27% margins, you know, if you look at what we are forecasting it, uh, for FY25, it's another 100 basis points of margin expansion uh, in aerospace, and that gets us, you know, uh, 27 and a half uh, ballpark. So, you know, really uh, strong margins in aerospace. Right. I, I guess what I'm trying to think about is assuming that the aftermarket OE mix kind of normalizes at some point, maybe that's a big assumption, I don't know, but if it does, should we be worried about potential kind of margin headwinds in that scenario? No, you know, when you look at uh, our, our team, you know, of all of the forecast tools that we have that we've improved across the company, our best tools remain uh, in the aerospace uh, verticals. And uh, I would tell you, our team, we've had multiple discussions with the team. We feel really good about that. And, uh, I, you know, I don't want to speak outside of FY25, but we feel really good about yeah. uh, what 25 has in store. Yeah, we, we um, feel very positive about air traffic growth, so we, we're not concerned about that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Nathan Jones from Steeple. Your line is now live. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Good morning. Nathan. I'm going to go back to uh, to the revenue guide. For as long as I can remember, Park has been guiding for a, a revenue split 1H to 2H of 58 to 42. Uh, so I wanted to ask, you've got a much larger backlog now than you've had historically, so potentially some better visibility um, out into that. Uh, so I'm, I'm just interested on, on you know, what your visibility into that second half revenue guidance is. Uh, based on where the backlog is and what kind of macroeconomic assumptions that that you've got baked in there. A lot of you know peers and competitors have been talking about lower capex spending going forward, uh, but it's it may, maybe that you guys went into the downturn first. You're coming out of it first. But just any color you can give us there. Well, you know, just just to run through it a little bit. Obviously, you know, for uh, aerospace, as we talked about, you know, we have a eight and a half percent organic growth guide out there, and the first half is at eleven percent, second half is at six percent, and that's really based because the, the comps get pretty tough when you get into the into the second half. So, obviously, we feel really good about aerospace. Um, you know, we have good visibility um, over. You know, we have a high backlog there, right? So, no concerns there. Um, when you look at North America. As Todd mentioned, we're guiding to 2% organic growth, minus one in the first half. And we, as we've talked about, you know, that's that's based off of, um, you know, a typical Q1 and based off of what we see today in the orders and, and the information that we have from our customers. Um, again, we expect, you know, continued softness and off-highway all year and transportation in the first half. So kind of going back to those forecasts for the market verticals. We do expect a gradual industrial recovery, as, we, as we've mentioned here, and, and that's what we have baked in. So, again, um, the growth uptick is mainly in the second half, and, and it, it is somewhat on easier comps. Those are, those are the inputs that we're looking at. And international, 1.5% uh, organic growth, again, negative 1% in the first half, second half at 3.5%. Um, as we mentioned, um, order rates improved, but they're still in negative territory. You know, our guidance assumes that Asia Pacific turns positive, um, offset by continued weakness in Europe. So um, that's what we're looking at right now. Um, again, softness around end markets in Europe, neutral growth in the guide for the full year. So that's that's um, what we have built into the guide. Do you need things like interest rate cuts to, to spur some of that recovery that you're looking for in the second half in, in various parts of the industrial economy? Like kind of what are the, the underlying assumptions that you've got that that uh, inform that expectation? Yeah, Nathan, this is Todd. Um, those certainly would be helpful. There's no doubt about it. Um, what we have baked into the uh, the numbers is really, again, you've heard us talk about our AI forecast. So we have 
uh, a, a variety of uh, macroeconomic forecasts that we're uh, using. There's nothing outside of anything that you, you're not seeing yourself. Um, it really is driven by uh, great aerospace performance, um, a gradual recovery in the industrial markets, mainly in the second half uh, of the fiscal year. And that's based off of you know, what we've seen orders do for uh, many, many, many years. Uh, we were really glad to see North American orders uh, uh, turn uh, not negative, and we were really happy to see the industrial orders uh, move to minus one. So um, all of that is uh, what we've been using to build our forecast. Awesome. Thanks for taking my questions. Yep. Thanks. Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is coming from Jeffrey Sprague from Vertical Research Partners. Your line is now live. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, hey, a lot of ground covered here. A couple things from me. First, just on um, uh, the divestiture, uh, Jenny or Todd, um, I think this sounds like it's kind of part and parcel to your kind of normal process of, you know, reviewing the portfolio and assets. But uh, should we view this as largely kind of a, a one-off, and obviously it just kind of came with something you recently acquired, or there's, you know, kind of other pieces here and there that could be methodically coming out as, you know, as your margin structure has moved up, right, and your, you know, your threshold for what's good enough rises, does that cause some additional things to shake out of the portfolio? You know, at, at Investor Day, we mentioned that we would, you know, continue to, to trim around the portfolio, but, um, you know, not anything significant. You know, all of our businesses have to perform. Every year we go through, um, you know, an analysis of our businesses, a best owner analysis. Um, but, again, nothing significant, Jeff. It would be, you know, just some trimming around the portfolio. And could you also just share with us your, your view on Aero for 2025 in terms of the big buckets Commercial, you know, OE versus aftermarket, military OE versus aftermarket. Absolutely. So on commercial OE, we are um, forecasting high single digit, um, you know, really big stuff of uh, narrow body um, rates and, and wide body ramp up. Um, commercial aftermarket, low double digits. And again, um, air traffic recovery, broad based growth there, been very strong as we've talked about today. Defense OE mid single digit, um, you know, an increase, increasing defense budget and uh, continued demand for legacy fighters. And then defense aftermarket, high single digit, um, and again, pointing to those um, public-private partnerships that we have with the, with the depots, that's really uh, proved to be great growth for us. Um, and um, again, retrofits, repairs, upgrades. Um, so really going to be a strong year for aerospace, high single digit at 8.5%. Great. I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you. Next question is coming from Nicole DeBlaze from Deutsche Bank. Your line is now live. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Hi, Nicole. Nicole. Um, I just wanted to ask another question on the divestiture, and we all have the revenue number that was in the press release, but I guess any color on whether the divestiture will be accretive to margins, and can you just confirm that that's all coming out of the industrial North America segment? Uh, yeah, Nicole, this is Todd. Um, it, it, it will all come out of the industrial North America segment uh, businesses. Um, you know, we do expect that to close sometime in Q2. Uh, it will be margin accretive. There's no doubt about it. Um, I'd rather wait until we get the actual close date to give you the exact color on that. Um, Jenny talked about it. Um, you know, it's a great business, uh, just maybe not perfectly aligned with our core products. Um, if you look at uh, the enterprise value that we got for that business, it's $560 million of enterprise value. Um, so uh, that there will be a gain on that, and uh, like I said, we'll be looking to uh, share more of that once it finally closes. Got it. That's really helpful. Thanks, Todd. And then on the outlook for international, um, it sounds like you guys are expecting Europe to be down again, if you could kind of confirm your thoughts there. And I know it's small for you, but any color on what you're seeing in China? Thank you. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the guide does assume that Asia-Pacific turns positive, um, offset by continued weakness in Europe. So the full year for Europe is is neutral to um, fiscal year 24. So just just continued softness there. Um, what I would say in um, China, it you know growth improved 
to negative low single digits in Q4, and Q4 orders increased due to some project orders. So, um, you know, there's there's some positive there. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Hey, Kevin, um, I think just in, in light of time, I think we have five minutes left, maybe one last question. Sure. Final question today is coming from Brett Lindsay from Azure Security. Your line is now live. Hey, good morning. Congratulations. Thanks, good morning. Brad. Thank you. Yeah, it, um, just a question on the, the margin outlook, but specifically gross margin. So another strong year in 24, but you're now seeing a better mix of secular in these applications. Are you embedding a higher than normal gross margin lift in the 25 outlook as you're um, seeing some traction here? Yeah, Brett, this is Todd. Thanks for noticing that. Uh, we've been working hard on uh, – on all elements of profitability for a long time here. Um, when you look at that uh, 50 basis points of uh, segment operating income expansion, the vast majority of that will come uh, in the gross margin line. Okay, got it, great. And then uh, I, I apologize if I missed it. On off-highway, so appreciate the color on ag versus construction, but was wondering if you could dimension the outlook between OE versus dis, uh, the distribution business and off-highway and what your level of visibility is on some of the OE inventories. Thanks. Um, you know, I, don't, I don't have a, a good picture of that that I could share with you today, but perhaps we can pick that up in a callback. Sounds good. I'll leave it there. Best of luck. Appreciate it, Brett. Thank you. We reached the end of our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the floor back over for any further closing comments. Okay, Kevin, thank you. Uh, this concludes our uh, earnings webcast. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, as always, we do appreciate your attention, interest, and support of Parker. Um, if anyone's got any more follow-up questions, uh, whether that's on the quarter, the year, or the FY25 guide, uh, Jeff Miller, uh, our VP of Investor Relations, and Yen Hua, our Director of Investor Relations, will be available uh, throughout the day and even into tomorrow if needed. Um, I hope everyone has a great day. We appreciate it. Thank you. That does conclude today's teleconference and webcast. You may disconnect your line at this time and have a wonderful day. We thank you for your participation today.